Welcome to the umpteenth episode of Unfuck the Poor, a non-income producing podcast from the unknown website askaleftist.com. Unfuck the Poor is an audiobook. If you didn't know, it's available for free at askaleftist.com, along with tons of supplemental material, including show notes, articles, additional media, and lots of links to resources. I want to take a moment to clarify something for you. Economics is a religion, and like all religion, there has to be a fundamental human desire to believe in something in order for it to propagate. We all want to understand the world around us to believe there is structure and something bigger that we can't quite see or grasp. So we talk about economics like it's a real thing, like it's something that will return riches to us multifold if we follow its rules. That's a very enticing thing to believe in, that the same rules that made Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett billionaires apply to us too, that we too could be billionaires, that among nearly 8 billion humans on this planet, each and every one of us could be the next unicorn, that super savvy genius who creates the next big thing. That's why we hustle, that's why we plan, that's why we make a lot of our decisions day to day. That's why we dream about Lamborghinis while we sit in traffic in our Hondas. There has to be something to believe in or else we wouldn't try so damn hard just to make ends meet. Because if we suddenly realize that this was it, that our jobs will never net us billions, then we might have to re-examine why exactly we settle for so much less in our daily lives. Why do we have to fear crippling debt from a hospital visit? Why do we have to worry about saving enough for retirement? Why do children starve? Why does anyone suffer in a world of total abundance? And then, then, we would seriously have to question our values that keep this system working the way it does. But that is just too damn hard, too damn brutal for our brains to contend with. So we need an enemy, a villain, and that's how we make sense of the world. To manufacture consent, you need an enemy, a target. That common enemy is the fifth filter. Communism, wow. terrorists, wow. immigrants. Whoa. Common enemy, a boogeyman to fear helps corral public opinion. Five filters, one big media theory. Consent is being manufactured all around you, all the time. Huh? Unfuck the Poor, Chapter 9, Only Villains. I've done you a terrible disservice. We've looked into historic events that were indeed economically significant, but we started doing things across the ocean, on ships, with bananas and coffee. And the fact is we aren't dealing with Air Force Ones and meaningless paper at this point. We're dealing with cargo ships and shipping containers and dropping bombs out of airships. Ships. We have to talk about international trade, the art of putting stuff on ships and sailing them away in exchange for money and, in some cases, machines that do war. Maybe I've been putting it off because it's a dreadful topic, but you know what? If this guy can talk about it like he knows what he's saying, then I think I can take a poke at it. Oh, shit. Well, it appears every image of Donald Trump is copyrighted, so just imagine I found a really good picture of him where his mouth is open and you're staring at his tongue and he's pointing at something off in the distance and you're looking at it like that. It's got to be a deep fake, but then you Google image search it and you see that, no, indeed, it was taken by an AP photographer in 2017. And then you're like, wait, why does he look so confused and angry? Is he angry because he's confused or is he confused at his anger? No one ever asks at these briefings, hi, how are you? Do you need to vent today? Please just let us know any under issues you might have so we can all help. Anyway, if you have a pair of Air Force Ones and I have a box of pixie sticks and I'm on one side of Steve Mnuchin's heated pool and you're on the other side, we might glance knowingly at each other and start gesturing in suggestive ways. And negotiations for the trade of one good for another have begun. If we keep things simple, we both acknowledge that on our own sides of Steve's pool, we do not have what the other person has. You and I shout across the pool and come to discover that, you know what, I really just need those Air Force Ones and you really just need this gross sugar in the form of pixie sticks and our needs are equal. So we take Steve's boogie boards and set our goods on them and we shove them off towards each other. And now I have the Air Force Ones and you have pixie sticks. This is the ancient form of trade or exchange known as barter, the direct exchange of one stuff for another stuff. And this is where the typical economist will lead us, from the natural progression of barter to modern monetary systems. This is the traditional approach economists give to the origins of money, and it makes sense. Two or more people yelling at each other, trying to offload stuff, will eventually need to simplify things, and money makes that possible. But that is wrong. The government creates money and corporations do not. The people bartering don't just invent money. 
If we take the barter leads to money approach, then everything we've already discussed kind of falls apart. Most educational approaches to economics starts with the barter begets money premise, but that's not how I started this book. I hit it all the way back here because absolutely nothing we have discussed can trace its origins back to the humble barter system. That's because the primitive forms of barter as described by economists don't exist. And this isn't hyperbole. The use of money, not just the dollar, is millennia old. Like, we're not entirely sure how long money has been around in one form or another. Indeed, the way economists talk about barter as though it is the de facto means of primitive trade because we are not primitive and we use charts and graphs is in complete discord with economic theory and the history of money as a whole. Let's look at it like this. You and I are holding Air Force Ones and Pixie Sticks, and Steve Mnuchin is watching us from his kitchen window like a weirdo. We have exchanged goods, and we're just kind of standing there. What the fuck else do we have to do? We have exactly what we wanted, so now we're going to fuck off and do some sweet dunks, and you're going to get a sugar high, and we know in the future if I wear out my shoes and you snort all that sugar, then we can meet again at Steve's pool and get what we want. Bartering is a closed system in which, once we have what we need or want, the transaction and circulation of stuff is over. Bartering is a fleeting moment in time between two or more parties that ends as soon as goods exchange hands. Okay, so how is that any different from money? Well, what do we have to do with money once we get it in order for it to be valuable? Holding it does absolutely nothing. In order for money to be worth your while, you have to spend it. Money is an open system, which is why we say money is in circulation, because it's floating around, winding all through the cosmos, passing through hands and wallets and purses and cash registers and ATMs and digital bank accounts, constantly satisfying our need to pay off a debt. Because the exchange is over and because the exchange took place between two parties in private without the use of money, it is intrinsically unrelated or disintegrated from the economy as a whole. In other words, economists do not follow their own bullshit because they don't articulate the difference between closed and open loops. Again, we have no idea where the idea of money came from because humans have always been willing to substitute a thing of value with something else, and bartering coexists with the actual ancient art of money making rather than giving way to it. The only ancient sources we have that explain the origins of money as the end result of bartering are philosophers like Aristotle and Plato who theorized that this is probably how it happened because they were using fucking money and they were looking at it like, boy, this money sure makes getting stuff a lot easier. I bet it replaced bartering. Sure, why not? And that's it. You can take that fun fact to the grave. What's even more interesting is that in time, bartering has come to replace the use of currency in some places. Caroline Humphrey's 1985 anthropological paper, Barter and Economic Disintegration, goes to great depth studying the Lahomey of Northeast Nepal, who, in spite of living in a world and indeed a nation with money, had by 1980 developed a complex barter system because, and I'm paraphrasing here, money was fucking worthless, so they came up with their own system of barter, which flying in the face of economic theory, did not produce an equilibrium price because they had no firmly established measures of weight and volume, and that was okay because it was still more reliable than dealing with businesses because businesses and markets fail. And when that happens, the people holding money can't eat that money, so they bartered instead. Now, what is equilibrium price? That just means when you buy stuff, you and the seller are neither advantaged nor disadvantaged. While you could assume that this has happened before in the history of humankind, I mean, sure, why not? We actually have a much more widely accessible area of study in the nature of money itself, but at no point do we see barter give birth to money. The simple fact is that bartering coexists with money usage, and it always has, as a matter of behavioral consistency. We can assume present-day humans do many of the same things we did 10,000 years ago, like put our mouths on each other's sex organs because that's just what we do. Now that the barter myth is out of the way, we can carry on with trade with the understanding that trade is not based on anything historic other than trade itself, and we can reasonably assume that, should some of us wind up being unable to afford money, we will most likely wind up switching to barter. This, in light of our much longer history with money as the mainstream, barter should be seen as a progression of trade rather than a regression from trade. Now, what do I mean by affording money? Well, money is worthless unless you spend it. If you can't hold on to money without starving or being evicted, you can't afford it. In the instance currency itself becomes difficult to handle, that is, that a society cannot afford to use money, perhaps because of its scarcity or because its value is unstable, the money itself may become something to be bartered. 
This phenomenon is unique in that money does not play the role of numeraire, so its value is no longer represented by the number attached to it. Instead, the currency is worth whatever's being traded, meaning if you hold $100 and the person you're bartering with is holding a trout and you are hungry and the other person has to pay rent and they possess one extra trout, the $100 and the trout have suddenly become equal in value. A numeraire is something that provides a common value to all stuff. In the $100 trout example, perhaps a trout is truly only worth $5. You should theoretically be getting 20 trout. But there is only one and you have no use for $100. The other person has an extra trout but needs $100. So you trade, and then the numeraire has vanished. Poof! When bartering, the numeraire may simply not exist. The value of items is wholly dependent on the specific trade between the parties. The outcome and pursuit of healthy trade, as mentioned before, is equilibrium pricing. I am willing to pay the price you want. Equilibrium pricing, and pricing in general, requires the establishment of relative value. This is unique from the barter scenario where $100 stops being worth $100. Relative value means figuring out what my stuff is worth compared to your stuff. This is unique from the barter scenario where $100 stops being worth $100. Assigning a relative value to the trap scenario would mean that you do not release the $100 until the other person has coughed up $100 worth of stuff, say a trout, five clothespins, a broken mug, five pounds of dirt, and a hand-drawn portrait of Dominic Fike. Alternatively, that $100 does get handed out at a price, the payment of interest. As we engage in barter, we are not partners, but are at once customer and salesperson. When we engage in the regular and continued exchange of goods for money, we become trade partners, both meeting each other's wants with stuff magically pulled out of Steve Mnuchin's garage. We can change quantities based on what we need, and we can substitute one stuff for another stuff. After all, if you're willing to offload stuff to me but aren't willing to give it away for free, it means that it has value to both of us. That type of economy also exists. The gift economy is essentially a debt economy, though it doesn't have to be. A gift is handed over with the expectation that something of equal value will be returned later, though a gift can also be returned for some act of equal generosity or all that you can afford. Consider Game of Thrones when Arya Stark gets that Bravosi iron coin and the pass raise Valar Mergulis from Jochen Hagar. Arya lets Jochen out of a paddy wagon, and for this kind act, he repays her with the coin and pass raise. But if we're being totally honest, obviously Jochen was never really in any peril as a prisoner and could have escaped on his own. Because there is a difference in the items that we are willing and able to trade, each of us has a comparative advantage over the other. Even if we cut out all the complications and limit our trade to only one item, Air Force Ones for instance, meaning both of us are standing on either side of Steve's pool holding a pair of Air Force Ones, we can still find out who has a comparative advantage over the other. Whoever can pull more Air Force Ones out of thin air in one hour has the advantage. Comparative advantage means whatever can be produced with the least total effort of labor, input, time, resources is a trade partner's comparative advantage. Trade can get very, very complicated very, very quickly. Before you know it, we're keeping logs of all the things we trade, how much we're spending on tariffs, figuring out how to get the highest value on our end, and hopefully coming up with a mutually beneficial trade scenario. Multiply this by a billion products and a billion supply chains and a billion factories, throw in different currencies with fluctuating exchange rates, and pretty soon you're generating huge charts about productivity and quarterly earnings. Add some other asshole in the mix, say Steve Mnuchin himself, who's now offering both Air Force Ones and Pixie Sticks, and now you and I are trying to figure out how to balance our comparative advantages with this new supplier to get the most value out of the least effort. And exchange rate is basically what one currency is worth compared to another. As of this writing, one dollar is worth 0.82 euros. If your brain gets backwards like mine, that means the euro is worth more than the dollar. It's just the comparable value of one currency to another. Now, because trading stuff for stuff can get so complicated, it helps to have something of common value that we can both trade in. Having a thing of common value, money, helps even more if we have to trade with other people across other pools. Maybe we're throwing stuff over Steve Mnuchin's fence and his neighbors throwing stuff back at us. In international trade, the thing of common value is most commonly the US dollar. It would not be great if the value of a dollar changed all the time, so it would be nice if the dollar could be tied to another thing of value, say for instance, gold. 
If you peg the value of the dollar to the value of gold, then quite literally the dollar is just as good as gold. It doesn't matter that gold is philosophically worthless. All that matters is one is just as good as the other. And if you're getting really philosophical, worthless piles of paper are quite equal to a brick of worthless shiny metal. The primary outcomes of the Bretton Woods Haunted Whorehouse Agreement was that one, the dollar would become the world's reserve currency, and two, the value of the dollar would be pegged to gold, the gold standard, as it were. It also, if you recall, established the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, both backed by the dollar and therefore also gold. While we're doing this trading, the measure of imports and exports is expressed as a trade balance, which can be positive or negative. A positive trade balance is also called a surplus, and a negative trade balance is a deficit. If your brain works like mine and that doesn't make sense, I'll simplify. Trade surplus means that a country exports more than it imports, and a trade deficit means a country exports less than it imports. If you think about trade in terms of sales, this becomes a lot simpler because when you look at the above definitions, they're kind of backwards. The more exporting we do, the more we are selling, the more money is coming in. The more importing we do, the more we are buying, the more money is going out. So here is the 100% simplified, easiest way to remember it. A trade surplus means you are importing more dollars. And a trade deficit means you are exporting more dollars. An overproduction of goods means a country's resources are being utilized faster than they can be consumed. On one hand, that means more stuff for trade, but on the other hand, it means wasted production. And here's where the trickery comes in. If you can cheaply produce and overproduce something, then the surplus can become an income stream. And when you do this large scale, like take over the whole country large scale as in the case of United Fruit Company, you can create your own comparative advantage by monopolizing the workforce, land ownership, and infrastructure for the mass production of coffee and bananas or, you know, other stuff. International trade is never balanced. It's impossible. The pursuit of close to balanced or near balanced is, well, honestly, what's the point? If you look at it in terms of physical goods shipped back and forth, the more stuff we're exporting means we literally have more than we know what to do with. We are overproducing, and the only way to offload the extra is to sell it in theory. But the United States government does not produce anything. U.S. corporations do the producing and exporting. When government officials start talking about trade deficits and surpluses, it has nothing to do with the government. But this is an effective way to isolate the private production of stuff, capitalism, and the public interest, democracy. The two are connected, but the government does not produce anything except dollars. I'll put this another way. When government officials start talking about trade policy, if it has a negative influence on the public interest, then it is acting in the interest of capitalism. The opposite is also true. We can divide government economic policy in general and trade policy specifically into two camps, public interest and corporate interest, also known as private interest. The public interest means attention is given to citizens. Private interest means attention given to corporations. It has absolutely nothing to do with you as a private citizen. Private citizens are technically the public. A private system is closed to the public, and this is also known as corporate interest. A trade surplus can also be seen as surplus labor or work. All that work being done, productivity, is converted to the value of stuff and then sold abroad. Running a trade deficit means we don't have the extra resources or productivity to send stuff across Steve's pool, and we require more stuff from our trade partners to get all the stuff we need, actually all the stuff we want. We are more than capable of being food and energy independent, but everything else is like stardust, LED light strips, and manga hoodies. And that might sound bad, and if this were household spending, then we would look at money going out, high, compared to money coming in, low, and panic. We'd vow to stop eating out and stop wasting money in general. The U.S. maintains immense trade deficits with foreign countries. They go all the way back to the 1980s and before. The U.S. Census Bureau actually has a really cool Excel spreadsheet that covers all trade balances back to 1985, and it suggests that we have been spending excessively for decades. So, is this a problem or no? Well, it really depends on why we're in the position in the first place. If the stuff imported is a result of not using all our available labor, like production capacity, then it must follow that importing the goods is due to cheaper labor required to make the stuff elsewhere. This is known as outsourcing. When stuff is more expensive to produce or provide at home, you will look for cheaper labor outside the country. Like, you know, when you call customer service and the person says their name is Rebecca when they are clearly not named Rebecca. 
If we are importing more raw materials than we're exporting, then it must follow that we need those resources for production. We are dependent on another country to provide those resources, so they must have more than we can produce cheaply, or we simply can't produce them here. But we would be importing resources in order to meet our production demands for other stuff. There are some jobs you cannot outsource. Construction workers, restaurant servers and cooks or chefs, poultry warehouse and slaughterhouse workers, doctors, nurses, drivers, teachers, police and fire services, tradespeople, hospitality workers, cleaners. I think you get the idea. They are the most domestically secure jobs. Some are well-paid and dignified, some are poorly paid and dignified, and some are poorly paid and undignified undignified in the sense that working conditions are brutal and anti-human. For example, Amazon workers peeing in bottles and defecating in bags, or meat packers wearing diapers because they can't take restroom breaks. Manufacturing and production are the easiest jobs to outsource. You just build a factory in a country with low labor standards and you can make your stuff cheaply. Or you can skip the factory building part and just buy stuff from an overseas supplier and then sell it at a markup. How do I explain markup? Well, let me put it like this. The price you pay for Air Force Ones in the store is a much higher dollar amount than Nike pays to make Air Force Ones, and the difference is the markup. If the cost of production, or labor, is the reason for the massive trade deficit, then we indeed have a problem. It means that labor is being underutilized in the home country, which means employment is low. Remember, if you were at home and you realized you were running a deficit, you'd be like, I need to start making meals at home and saving money. Well, it's hard to do that when you've gotten rid of your kitchen and don't know how to cook. When Trump declared a trade war on China, he was talking about this exact thing. And I bet you didn't think Trump would be right about anything. Well, that's about all he got right in basically his entire life. If employment is low due to outsourcing labor, as has consistently been the case since the 1980s, then the likelihood of having available infrastructure, the means of production, to increase employment and production at home is low. To put this into perspective, let's discuss capacity utilization. If a business, not necessarily a factory, can produce $100 per hour but is only producing $74, it has a capacity utilization of 74%. So let's play a fun game and we'll see if this book has taught you anything so far. Since 1967, do you think our capacity utilization has increased or decreased? I'll give you, nope, no time, correct. Our capacity utilization has steadily decreased for the last half century. With steadily lower capacity utilization, whether you count it as efficiency or availability, you know, are you an engineer or an economist, we should obviously, one, have less to sell, two, require fewer workers, and three, need to buy from somewhere else. Now, there are a lot of ways to argue and beleaguer the idea of capacity utilization. Is it a relevant metric at all? Does it represent a more efficient production process? Keeping in mind this measures physical production as well as service industries. Is the measure consistent? Are 1967 numbers calculated the same as 2021 numbers? Reducing all of these arguments brings us back to the graph itself. The tendency of capacity utilization is to ebb and flow, but there is an observable decrease over 50 years. That's what the numbers say. Now, to my mind, reduced production at home would equate to increased demand on imports, and I'll be damned if the two metrics, utilization capacity and negative trade balance, don't track in those directions for the same period, 1970 to 2020. With lower production of stuff here in the States and an increase in imports from outside the States, the result, as we've discussed, is a trade deficit. So, Trump was right. And he would have been right if he asserted this fact at any point in the past 36 years, which he had, and he decided to solve the crisis. It's time for the Unfuck the Poor Activity Zone pop quiz! To solve the trade deficit crisis, did Trump A, inject money domestically in the form of subsidies and federal grants and loans to boost domestic production, B, increase tariffs on stuff bought from other countries, C, increase nationwide employment utilizing existing equipment for public work programs like repairing and upgrading infrastructure, expanding public parks and park services, or investing in community development programs, or D, utilize any of the actual smart people, any of the 330 million U.S. citizens to develop any sort of comprehensive or intelligent plan. If you circled A and B, thank you for downloading and printing this book, but you've ruined it by writing on it. But anyway, you're correct. 
Except Trump didn't exactly inject money into the economy so much as he stripped regulation in certain industries. Arguably, this was a net neutral decision because lax regulations only means that money gets shifted from regulatory requirements that consume X amount of labor and resources to more production consuming X amount of labor and resources. Basically, the burden gets shifted from one to the other. And he attempted to open up the United States to increased oil drilling, which, let's face it, is possibly the most genocidal thing a president could decide to do in the 21st century short of opening up literal killing fields. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Our unwillingness to take the lead on green energy production and eliminate our need for fossil fuels is going to kill us. When Trump gleefully announced he was going to open up Alaskan oil reserves, he may as well have told Americans, me and you, that we and our offspring and their offspring could all go fuck themselves in an uninhabitable wasteland. Listen, I don't know who thinks electric vehicles are still a fad or that windmills cause cancer or they don't understand the use of solar battery storage, but they're fucking idiots. What? Oh, trade. That's right. So Trump increased tariffs on lots of stuff coming from lots of countries, but he was really trying to pressure China into being a better partner, though therapy arguably works best. And his trade war with China did indeed raise the cost of stuff here in the United States, but it did not spur the desired increase in production. Those are fairly common sense results that every economist warned about, because you don't need charts and graphs to see that reduced capacity utilization means that we can't just pick up the slack when tariffs go up. I mean, we have the capacity, but do we have the labor and resources? That's obvious, right? So who am I about to side with, Trump or economists and the Associated Press and the National Farmers Union and literally everyone else? Neither, because neither side of the argument, Trump was correct about the dysfunction of the trade balance and everyone else was correct about the outcome of higher tariffs, neither side considered how we wound up in this position in the first place, because rethinking that shit show would have made, you know, a lot more sense. You can apply the inverse relationship of trade deficits to other deficits too, because that's how a deficit works. For starters, if we run a trade deficit with China, that means China runs a trade surplus with the United States. In the case of the national deficit, you know, the thing everyone is always droning on about, the government's deficit is the public's surplus. That money is in the economy floating around doing work. If the government began running a budget surplus, that would translate to a public deficit. Everyone wants to eliminate all the deficits, but no one really addresses that very simple equation. Government money going to the public equals a deficit, and public money going to the government equals a surplus. No one has yet to explain how the government restricting the flow of money to the public, which arguably needs more money than the government, makes any sense because that's not how it's sold to us. It's sold to us in the opposite language. The government must reduce its spending to build a government surplus rather than the equally true statement, the government must take more money out of the economy to run a public deficit. Because the way you increase or decrease a deficit doesn't really affect the positive or negative sign you put in front of the number. A government surplus just means the government has taken money out of the functioning economy without any practical use for it. All that being said, the practical implication of building a surplus is to control inflation. It's a practical tool, so let's just think in those terms. In a booming economy, more work, more consumption, and more money circulating is kept in check with higher taxes and less discretionary government spending, both of which impact low and moderate income households the most. Higher taxes means lower net income for households, while lower government spending means less public assistance and benefits for those with lower net incomes. The middle class might have to pinch pennies, but the poorest Americans, even if they are exempt from higher income taxes, are still subject to the market impacts of inflation, higher prices for goods goods overall, higher rents, restricted access to capital overall. Inflation is not controlled by currency circulation but by market conditions. Attempting to alter market conditions to fight inflation puts financially vulnerable citizens in unsustainable situations, while flooding the market with dollars exacerbates inflation. However, matching inflation with spending programs that keep low and moderate income earners at a living wage level is the only sustainable solution as long as we have fluctuating markets. If you were interested enough to look up the utilization capacity and trade balance graphs that I referenced earlier, and if you're observant, you may have noticed that things started to go south real quick around 1995. So let's paint a picture of 1995. We already know that this old house had begun birthing DIY shows and there was an over-interest in Martha Stewart and her magic hot glue gun. But what else was going on in 1995? 
First and most obviously for me, I was 10 years old and it was incredible. I was in fifth grade and I'm fairly certain I had at some point gotten a buzz cut and inherited an Alice in Chains t-shirt from my 16 year old brother. So, you know, I was doing all right. I was still watching a lot of The Simpsons and Ren and Stimpy, and I had recently discovered Playboy. Internet was slow in those days, so I just spent a lot of time at my friend Dusty's house, whose parents happened to have 30 years worth of Playboys and jobs that ended at 7 p.m. I'm also fairly certain Dusty and I burned a bunch of stuff in the boat shed behind his house and broke bottles in the alley while we were back there. Rollerblades were a thing back then. Uh, what else? Oh, we had a cat. Most of that year was dominated by the O.J. Simpson trial. I remember it vividly, by which I mean I vaguely remember adults talking about it. Listen, the, the 90s were a lot to go through as a kid. We had Lorena Bobbitt doing a whole thing with a penis. Nancy Kerrigan got happened to by Tanya Harding. Our genes became huge for no reason. And I remember reading an article in a, quote, news magazine for kids that explained such things as the Bosnian War, Armadillo Migration, and NAFTA. The North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, is why I spent the last 19 or so pages droning on about trade. In the abstract, international trade is meant to be a work of constant refinement. We have risen as a species above our primitive ancestors who were so dumb and unrefined that they merely bartered for stuff. Modern humans, on the other hand, are smart and sophisticated, and have created careful trade channels, agreements, and mechanisms that link all of humanity together through globalization. There shall be no barriers to free trade and no diplomatic hurdles too complex to negotiate. There shall be a unified global alliance among peaceful nations and among free trade's detractors. There shall be only villains. But how did we get to NAFTA? Free trade in the American vernacular makes no goddamn sense, so let's just go there. Free trade is, to the economist, trade that is totally unrestricted by any government policy. To the economist, Free trade is completely self-regulating thanks to the natural laws of economics. The government should not have a say in trade because the two exist in completely separate worlds. The advocacy for free trade is de facto advocacy for laissez-faire capitalism, and that is the economist's ultimate goal because the world of economics and the world of politics are completely separate. And there's also this fascination with just pushing buttons to see what will happen. In the introductory economics textbook titled Economics, one that I have referenced a handful of times so far if you're checking my references, Paul Krugman and Robin Wells describe briefly the 2009 tariffs on tires imported to the U.S. from China in a section titled Tires Under Pressure. The press covering these tariffs at the time framed the president as a pawn. Krugman and Wells, or at least the associate editors at Worth Publishers, frame the tire tariffs as a failure to achieve free trade, though not a failure that should make you cynical about free trade in general. What? To read news articles from 2009 on the tire tariffs is like that E.T. Atari game no one played. It makes no sense and you want to bury it in a landfill. Some articles will say in the same sentence that Obama wanted to repay the unions who had contributed to his campaign and then will have a quote from the tire manufacturer itself, though they are not the same thing. United Steelworkers pushed for the tariffs in 2009 and again in 2014 and again in 2020. The original tariffs of 2009 prompted companies with Chinese-based factories to pack up and move to other Asian countries like Thailand, South Korea, Vietnam, and Taiwan, which led to the next wave of tariff pushes in 2014 and then again in 2020. The tariffs do have the intended result, higher costs on tires from China, but they also have a predictable response by the companies losing Using sales. They simply move operations to regions unencumbered by those tariffs. The union push here is not to be minimized. The tariff worked. From 2014 to 2019, the import of Chinese tires had fallen 94% from 60.5 million per year to 3.4 million per year. And while the tariff did not bring back manufacturing jobs because of, you know, utilization capacity and price increases, the tariff did slow job losses in the tire manufacturing sector. The tariff was branded as bad for consumers and retailers alike by the tire industry Association. And the United States Chamber of Commerce, uh, remarkably, stated that the Obama administration needed to adopt forward-looking policies on free trade agreements, rather than considering the 5.6 million U.S. manufacturing jobs lost to free trade over the decade leading up to the 2009 tire tariff. 
And now we can go back to the public interest and the private interest because this is where people get stuck in their own heads. If government policy negatively affects corporations, then it is working in the public interest and vice versa. In the case of the tire tariffs, the negative effects were tied to consumers. Higher tariffs meant higher prices overall for us, the consumer. That sounds like it has a negative effect on the public interest. Now we're paying more for tires, so obviously that's a win for corporations. But that's simple misdirection. An increase in price on imports means they must then compete with the higher priced tires produced at home in an effort to protect jobs, real life American tire making jobs. That is, the public interest is being served by the protection of jobs and the corporate interest is at risk by no longer having the price advantage. When the consumer is highlighted as a victim, we are not being included as a matter of social equity. We are being included as a revenue stream. Hurting consumers could just as well be called reducing sales. Anyway, Krugman and Wells offer this summary about the tire tariffs. Quote, You shouldn't be too cynical about this failure to achieve complete free trade in tires. World trade negotiations have always been based on the principle that half a loaf is better than none, that it's better to have an agreement that allows politically sensitive industries to retain some protection than to insist on free trade purity. In spite of such actions as the tire tariff, world trade is, on the whole, remarkably free, and freer in many ways than it was just a few years ago. End quote. Introducing tariffs in an effort to slow job losses or increase consumption of domestically produced stuff is known as protectionism. It is literally the attempt to protect the home country from some harmful economic activity abroad. In the case of tires, the specific harmful economic activity has a name, dumping. Basically, a country or an industry dumps products into a trade partner's economy and sells it under market value. Local retailers and manufacturers can't compete, and the result is a loss in jobs. Anti-dumping and countervailing petitions, or ADCVD, were put forth by United Steelworkers, and the result was media misdirection and further dumping by the same companies but sourced from different countries. Anti-dumping and countervailing petitions, it's a whole thing. Basically, the influx of stuff from one country to another is made possible by some kind of subsidy from the exporter's government, either cash injections or low-interest loans, that allow for stuff to be dumped in the U.S. or elsewhere. Countervailing measures are then taken in the U.S. in the form of tariffs, in this instance, to offset the low price of stuff coming in. But let's go back to Krugman and Wells and remember this quote, World trade negotiations have always been based on the principle that half a loaf is better than none, that it's better to have an agreement that allows politically sensitive industries to retain some protection than to insist on free trade purity, end quote. In terms of the half loaf comment, we only have to look at the Bretton Woods Agreement to determine that modern global trade, that is trade policy that took over after World War II, is actually a full loaf in terms of American record keeping. The half loaf comment is more a statement on how the U.S. must now deal with the ramifications of unfettered trade, i.e. being held accountable in real time for the loss of jobs. Were it indeed a half loaf, we would not have faced the circumvention by tire manufacturers moving operations to other countries with cheaper labor. Rather, we would have committed to protecting jobs on the whole from all dumping, but we left a loophole. It is unfortunate that the United Steelworkers is vilified for its role in the rise of tire prices while at the same time being tasked with pursuing every instance of cheap tire dumping and having to deal with the real-time loss of employees. The explanation that politically sensitive industries must be pandered to and therefore economists cannot have their wildest wishes of fully-fledged free markets realized leaves a lot to be desired. Most importantly is the absence of any definition for the politically sensitive industry. Without this, Krugman and Wells' assertion is, well, I think they specifically leave out this definition because without it, their assertion can be vague yet tidy. Political sensitivity is simply volatility. It is essentially an unknowable factor that affects how the market, local, national, or global, and by market we can mean one industry or a cluster of industries, like tire specifically or automotive in general. Anyway, it's how the market responds to political changes such as new regulations, new laws, new leadership. Industries that rely on trade, contract enforcement, and labor have higher volatility when political risks are high, and global trade is even more volatile. 
There is no trade industry unaffected by politics. Trade itself is inherently politically sensitive, which, again, I point you to the Bretton Woods Agreement. The entire fucking point of the agreement was to position the U.S. at the top of the global order so that trade volatility didn't disrupt the corporate interest. The only volatility that has yet to be fully checked is the pesky unions wielding ever-diminishing power to safeguard against job losses. How did we get to the point where, as an aside, an economics textbook would lament the limitations put on free trade by an American union and describe a tariff as but a concession to a politically sensitive industry while completely ignoring the political sensitivity of all trade? I think I have an idea. In 1944, the price of gold, as pegged by the dollar, was $35 per ounce per the Bretton Woods Agreement, and all member countries' currencies were set to the value of the dollar. The price of gold, $35 per ounce, was the standard rate for all transactions between national banks. From World War II to 1970, the U.S. enjoyed stability, but not wild growth, in part because World War II had launched significant production capacity and, with the war over, capacity utilization was pretty high. We made lots of stuff and had lots lots of babies, boomers who benefited from all the prosperity and social programs from World War II on. Western Europe and Japan, on the other hand, experienced huge growth due to all the catching up they had to do because everything had been bombed. This post-war period is the, quote, golden age of economic growth in the United States. It saw huge growth and no major economic recession. This is important because were you to ask an American conservative smart person, they would be happy to point out that America had several recessions and therefore the golden age is a myth. This is the stance of the Foundation for Economic Education, a right-wing free market propaganda think tank, and it is hyper-focused on one particular aspect of this era, the 90% marginal tax rate on the highest earning Americans. The argument from conservatives is that the 90% marginal tax rate was ineffective because no one paid it because rich people are very good at avoiding taxes. So, in the future, we should definitely not go back to such high tax rates for the very rich. There is plenty in the nobody paid 90% taxes debate to eviscerate, but this is becoming a tangent and I want to make it kind of short. So sure, let's say only eight Americans paid their fair share of the 90% tax rate. We'll agree on that or whatever insignificant number of people who paid actually is. The misdirection is strong in this argument and because of that, I don't care how many people paid this tax because it doesn't fucking matter. Every single top tax rate, meaning it applied only to the highest earners from 1952 to 1963, was higher than at present. And the trend has been a steady decrease in the fair share of taxes paid by top earners since then. Let me be slightly more specific. From 1952 to 1963, the top tax rates for one, ordinary and earned income was 91%, two, capital gains was 25%, and three, corporate income was 52%. In 2021, those numbers are 37% for ordinary and earned income, 20% for capital gains, and 21% for corporate income. The focus on tax avoidance practices of the uber wealthy does not play well when you consider that the lowest earners were paying 20% without the benefit of being able to avoid those taxes. Arguably, the only thing keeping our struggling economy propped up was the continued sacrifice of the working poor, who had seen taxes jump from 4.4% in 1940 to 10% in 1941 to 19% in 1942 and up to 23% by 1944 when the top earners tax rate peaked at 94% which apparently no one was paying. The myth of tax equality is often waved around by the right, like the percent number itself is the focus rather than the dollar figure or its impact. Take, for instance, the late Herman Cain's 999 tax policy. 9% taxes all around. Everyone pays their fair share. Never mind that 9% of poverty level income is a more consequential amount to a poor person earning $12,880 per year, that's the poverty level in 2021, than 9% of the minimum $600,000 a year for a top earner. I'm simply using Herman Cain's 999 proposal because it's a simple thing that sounds smart but is actually dumb, and current smart people still sing the praises of a flat tax rate. For those who don't want to do the math, I've already done it for you. That is $1,159 in taxes for the person making $12,880 a year and $54,000 in taxes for the person making $600,000. Yes, that's 9% for both, but one person has $11,721 left over and the other person has $546,000 after taxes. 
I'll spell it out for you. The already poor person, right at the poverty threshold, has now been taxed into poverty, below the poverty threshold. The other person has been taxed into being half a millionaire. I know what you're probably thinking. That's not fair. Any tax at the poverty threshold would tax someone into poverty. And I'll just leave it up to you to decide if it is justifiable to tax people into poverty as long as we do it indiscriminately or if, instead, you're not an asshole. Uh, where was I? Oh yes, it was the golden age. America wound up on top and Western Europe and Japan played catch up. The explosion in growth cannot be understated. The need for labor due to the utter destruction in Europe and Japan led to a massive workforce and reconstruction efforts. This is in contrast to countries that would develop later through modernization rather than an increased workforce. An important distinction if you, you know, study that kind of thing. Viewing trade through this golden age lens and ignoring all else, America's international partners were growing concerned with the amount of money America was making. I'll get back to that. Okay, so the value of the dollar is pegged to the price of gold, right? And the U.S. holds most of the world's gold, right? And central banks hold on to cash reserves. So it's late 1960s, Don Draper's having a mental breakdown, and America, which had been steadily depleting its reserves, is now adding to the reserves while at the same time spending more and more on war in Vietnam. I know you're smart, but just as a reminder that the reserves represent a much larger amount of money that has been issued as debt. So, with all these other currencies pegged to the value of the dollar, pegged to gold, the other countries add to their reserves as well and notice that inflation is rising. And now they're like, hey, whoa, hold on. If my dollar is inflating, then the dollar itself is inflating. And then everyone is like, hey, Don Draper, it looks like you're going through some stuff. The dollar had been a fiat currency before we abandoned the Bretton Woods Agreement. The fixed value of gold was just a white lie we told the world. Because of the U.S.'s unique money-making scheme, when the U.S. government needs money for things like war, it can issue T-notes, bills, and bonds for sale on the secondary market, which are debt notes, remember. The Fed can buy those notes, bills, and bonds from the market, and the United States basically gets an influx of cash as a loan. This would be something we are already familiar with, the monetization of debt. The interesting thing here is that the Treasury never has to pay that amount back to the Fed. The Fed agrees to hold onto that debt in perpetuity. It is a permanent asset for the Fed and a permanent liability for the Treasury. Guess who is never going to foreclose on the White House? The Fed. When we talk about eliminating the national debt, we are talking about deleting all the Treasury notes, bills, and bonds that are outstanding, many of which are held by the Fed, which is never going to cash out. So anyway, the world kind of notices this whole thing the U.S. is doing, issuing debt and more debt and basically living off all this debt, which is inflating prices in their home countries and making that stable gold standard dollar unstable. Because of this instability, American allies wanted to redeem their dollars for gold. America had $12 billion in gold reserves, but it did not have $12 billion in liabilities. It held closer to $70 billion. Recall, if you will, the silliness of a bank run where everyone is worried about the bank's solvency, so they rush to the bank to withdraw their cash, and lo and behold, because the bank is only holding reserves and issuing debt, there is not enough cash on hand. That's what's going on here, except instead of dollars, it's gold, and instead of a single bank, it's the entire global currency tied to the dollar. And instead of being held accountable, because the United States wrote all the post-war rules, when countries started cashing out for gold, the U.S., Richard Milhouse Nixon specifically, just said, you know what, fuck it, the dollar is its own thing and we're not doing the gold thing anymore. Seriously. The U.S. wrote itself into this power position and then predictably exploited it by chucking preemption at the world. On August 15, 1971, the Bretton Woods Agreement was simply over, and the price of gold was no longer fixed at $35 per ounce. It was revalued at $38, then $42, and then they were like, fuck it, let it float. And by the end of the 1970s, the price of gold was $455 an ounce, a rise of 1,200%. That's a lot of inflation. Gold was just one instance of high inflation. Virtually all commodities exploded. Pig iron, aluminum, and tin all inflated, with silver nearly matching gold at a 1,065% increase. Okay, so what? Everything cost a lot, and now all the countries are on their own with this new, unstable global economy. The U.S. dollar was not doing great as a result of, essentially, the wool being lifted from the world's eyes. The dollar was not worth what they thought it was worth, and since international trade contracts used the dollar as the numeraire, their revenues began to shrink on sales of those inflated commodities. You can go back and read the bold definitions if you have to. I did. One of these commodities being traded in U.S. dollars where revenues were falling was, and you may be intimately familiar with it, oil. 
The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, a literal cartel, relied heavily on the pegging of the dollar to gold, as gold is a major transfer currency in the Hawala system used extensively in the Middle East, parts of Africa, and India. A cartel is an organization of producers, like a cooperative arrangement, like Florida's natural growers, but a little different in that we wouldn't call American citrus growers a cartel because cartels are illegal in the U.S., but we would definitely call a group of foreign oil producers a cartel, even if they are cooperative. You can nitpick this definition all you want. The Hawala system is a payment system that uses intermediaries to conduct transactions. In a simplified version, two humans use two other human brokers to trade money. It is essentially an honor system that uses passwords like Valar Mogulis. How does the Hawala system tie in with oil and gold? Take the situation of a Middle Eastern oil producer. You have an abundant resource, oil, that other people want, which you can safely sell at a predictable rate for a gold-based currency, the dollar. The dollar is useless to you, but the gold that you can get with the dollar has value in Hawala exchanges. Everyone accepts gold and its value, thanks to the dollar, is stable. This is a long way around saying that for 20 years, 1947 to 1967, 10 to 15 barrels of oil would fetch one ounce of gold, also known as $35. From the point of view of OPEC, gold must remain stable, so they increase the oil barrel price to maintain the historic range of 10 to 15 barrels for one ounce of gold. In other words, as the dollar value changed, the price of oil did not, at least not by the measure of barrels to ounces of gold. By 1974, OPEC increased the price of oil from $4.31 to $10.11, keeping the oil-gold exchange at 12.8 barrels per ounce, maintaining the integrity of the Hawala system. You can read an American textbook to get the West's interpretation of events, aggression on behalf of the oil producers, muscle flexing and all that, but the fact is that America's money shell game significantly impacted economies that depended on America's commitment to its dollar-gold standard. You know, the commitment we abruptly gave up on when it became apparent we did not actually have the gold to hold up our end of the bargain. To protect their economic system, OPEC nations adjusted the price of oil. The difference between the oil-gold standard and, say, the tire dollar standard should be apparent. There is no difference, except that in one instance we vilified unions, and in the other we vilified the Middle East, both in defense of the consumer, the party that hands over money to corporations. While America was inflating its own currency, intentional or not, the global economy was experiencing unprecedented growth and a subsequent need for more and more oil. This is the second part of the story that gets lost when discussing the aggressive pricing of oil. Global oil consumption increased at double the rate of population growth from 1950 to 1970. By 1973, the amount of available oil, the amount of milkshakes sucked up by Daniel Plainview, had increased by 250%. To my knowledge, the phrase aggressive demand has never been used to describe the West's thirst for oil, only aggressive pricing to describe oil suppliers. This was not a surprise to the United States. Part of the Council on Foreign Relations' early planning for the post-war global economy was predicated on the knowledge that petroleum resources constituted significant dollar investments in Iraq, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, and that the area was of strategic significance. Due to its proximity to the Soviet Union, the Middle East, and therefore the U.S.'s uninterrupted supply of cheap oil, was in a precarious situation with little to no active U.S. military presence to prevent Soviet intervention, perceived or real. Enter John Foster Dulles, who, while keeping an eye on your bananas and coffee in Guatemala, was also keenly aware of the situation in Iran in 1951, when Mohammad Mossadegh was elected prime minister following his push to nationalize the British-owned Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, or AIOC. Similar to the democratic election of Yakobu Arbenz and the nationalization of Guatemalan land, Mossadegh did not yank the milkshake out of Britain's hands. Similar to Arbenz's compensation offer, Mossadegh offered job guarantees for British oil workers and 25% net profits from oil sales. This is arguably a much more generous offer than Arbenz would offer Guatemala's private landowners a few years later. Here, we can employ the standard international rulebook, economic warfare, military shows of force, and propaganda. Just keep in mind that the Iranian coup occurred in 1953, and the Guatemalan coup would occur one year later. Dulles was merely writing a playbook. I could practically write the entire section on United Fruit all over again to describe the assault on Iran, but there are a few takeaways. 
First, the replacement of democratically elected Mossadegh with Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, the Shah, if you're nasty, is yet another notch in the belt of U.S. anti-democratic sentiment. Second, it marked the end of a fragile stability in the Middle East that is apparent today. And third, well, in my opinion, the fall of Mossadegh is the fall of Iran, and the fall of Iran is the fall of international trade in its entirety. From this point on, trade itself, the sale of goods across Steve Mnuchin's pool, becomes absolutely pointless. It becomes just a thing we do as a matter of course. It has consequences, sure, like tire tariffs and the exhaustion of supply chains in a pandemic. But from the fall of Iran going forward, the money game changes from one of stuff to one of dollars. It doesn't matter what is being traded as long as the dollar takes precedent. And eventually the dollar itself becomes the fundamental thing being traded. I'm referring to the financialization of trade, which is a neoliberal wet dream, and it comes to the forefront after we fuckify Iran. So first, the Shah. The Shah, it should be noted, was exceedingly generous to the United States and Britain. They had granted him a whole-ass kingdom, and all they wanted in exchange was 60% ownership of Iranian oil production. It should be noted here, 60% ownership, 50% of profits with Iran unable to audit. The Consortium Agreement of 1954, at the behest of Eisenhower and helped in part by the debilitating British sanctions, was an exploitative pact. Eisenhower made public comments which reflect the nature of the Consortium Agreement, essentially that Iranians were too incompetent to control oil production and set prices. It also subjected Iran's share of profits to American tax laws. It forced Iran to expand the reach of its oil fields and provide a wide array of services from housing, public transportation, roads, healthcare, social welfare, all with a focus on the relocated Westerners who had to live, work, and operate businesses in the area with scarce contribution from the majority shareholders. This is similar to the monopolization of infrastructure in Guatemala, but in Iran, the cost of all this infrastructure was offloaded onto Iran itself. Further, payments to Iran were to be made in British pounds, with limited ability to convert it to gold. Bad for the Hawala system. And lastly, the agreement made a provision for $510 million in compensation to Iran with oil, discounted at $0.10 cents per barrel. I feel like this requires a snarky dialogue, so I'll take myself up on it. Uh, and for the uh, last bit here, we'll pay you half a billion dollars. Would you like that in uh, oil or... Oh, cash would be good. Gold would be better. Mm, yes, right. Oil it is. But we, we have lots of oil. We'll give you a discount. Oh, wait. It's a great rate. We'll knock off 95%. Uh, shit. And that is how international trade negotiations are done. Fuck the poor and make them pay for it. Much lip service is given to the booming Iranian economy that occurred under the Shah's 25-year rule, infrastructure, education, social programs, but little attention is paid to the fact that the industrialization and modernization were done as a service to the imperial occupiers masquerading as international oil companies. That Iranians also benefited was merely a side effect, and because we would be inhumane to consider all of Iran one comprehensive group benefiting under the Shah, We should be curious as to whether Iranians were indeed prospering during this period of oil riches and unprecedented growth. They were not, at least not the poor Iranians. In a July 6, 1960 National Security Council report on the U.S.-Iranian policy, the NSC notes that things were not going well in Iran. Quote, Current dissatisfaction is based in part on awakening popular expectations for reform of Iran's archaic social, economic, and political structure and a concomitant disillusionment with the Shah's limited efforts to date to move in this direction with resolution and speed. Principal support for the Shah comes from large landholders and their conservative business associates, the top ranks of the government bureaucracy, and senior military officers. The growing educated middle classes constitute the basic opposition to the Shah. Increasing numbers in these groups find Iran's antiquated feudal structure and the privileges of the ruling classes anachronistic in a modern world. The business activities, general irresponsibility, and in some cases, outright corruption of some members of the royal family, civil service, and high military command have further contributed to growing popular discontent. Although economic development expenditures are currently substantial, the development program has not achieved the desired political impact because of a tendency to emphasize long-term projects, disorganization and corruption, delays resulting from administrative inefficiency, the Iranian propensity to view achievements in very personal terms, and, until recently, a failure to take steps to publicize results. 
Militarily, Iran is dangerously and directly exposed to Soviet expansion. The army is only capable of maintaining internal security and offering very limited resistance to aggression by a major power. The Air Force and Navy are weak and ineffective. The Shah's preoccupation with military matters, as well as his neglect of adequate economic and social reform through his concentration on such matters, has created difficulties for the United States as well as considerable urban discontent. End quote. In other words, Iran did not enjoy its own golden age as portrayed by the West. Rather, the beneficiaries were primarily the wealthy and corporations. Discontent among the middle class and poor was growing, according to the NSE's own intelligence, made possible by another piece of paper, the Eisenhower Doctrine, which set the course for the U.S.'s strategic interest in Iran for purposes of Soviet surveillance as well as, it can be assumed, protecting oil supplies. It is no coincidence that the fall of the Shah in 1979 coincides with the end of the Consortium Agreement of 1954, the 25-year oil production pact that kept the Shah in power thanks to his position as, according to Iranian student protesters in the U.S., a puppet of the states. And in case you need to do the math, 1954 plus a 25-year oil production pact uh, equals 1979, which is when the Shah fell from power. To the extent that a head of state installed by a foreign government can be autonomous, the Shah was less of a puppet and more of the dance-on-command kind of entertainment. The U.S. couldn't control his moves, but they could make him dance. And I'm pretty happy with that analogy. The Shah's leadership earned high praise from Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, and that should tell you most of what you need to know about the Shah. Nixon is perhaps most famous for his quote, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. And Henry Kissinger was both the conductor of coups and an unprosecuted war criminal. He is remarkably still alive as of March 2021. Nelson Rockefeller, vice president under Gerald Ford, also really liked the Shah, comparing him to Alexander the Great and suggesting his domestic policy of martial law and disappearing people could, quote, teach us how to govern America, end quote. I will arbitrarily note at this point that Iran is not just some random member of OPEC. Iran, and the Shah specifically, acted as the leader of the oil-producing nations, having, if not the final say, been the loudest, most obnoxious voice on production and pricing, and was, therefore, the most consequential partner the U.S. had at the time as far as oil goes. However it was viewed within the member nations, this was certainly the belief in Washington. In January 1973, the Shah revealed that Iran would not be renewing the consortium agreement when it expired in 1979, and on December 22nd of 1973, the members of OPEC decided unilaterally to raise the price of oil, and they raised it sharply from $5.12 a barrel to $11.65 a barrel starting in January of 1974. And this, well, when Nixon loves you, apparently he really loves you because he doesn't call you up and say, Shah, moon to my stars, this pricing is crazy, can you dial it back? But that was what Bill Simon, energy czar under Nixon, expected Nixon to do because that's the sort of thing you can do when you're the president and you're best buds with the dictator of a major oil-producing nation. Bill Simon, not best buds with anyone but lovable in his own way, called out the Shah while visiting France, calling him, quote, a nut. He wants to be a superpower. He's putting all his oil profits into domestic investment, mostly military hardware, end quote. Attempting to sway Saudi Arabia, whose Western trade partners had been losing out on the pricing gouge, Simon played on their lesser hand. They were missing out while Iraq and Iran profited. Bill Simon and Sheikh Yamani created an oil auction scheme that would stabilize prices, but then the Shah found out and threatened to stop oil production altogether, so the whole thing went nowhere. The Shah, who loved money and weapons, had predictably become addicted to all the money that lots of oil brings and was drunk on the imagined power that the possession of fancy weapons gives to a nationalist dictator. And all the smart people in the White House were like, well, this is unexpected. The funny man who danced for them was no longer funny, and he no longer danced. He may very well have been saying, fuck you, for the half billion dollars he'd been paid one dime at a time, and for the 40% he'd been left with, and because he was an actual fucking dictator. Anyway, oil prices were slated to go up, up, and away. Some called this the oil embargo, but whatever. This caused Nixon to go to the Saudis and was like, my longtime friends, holy fucking shit, I need you guys to agree to buy U.S. securities with your oil money. So they did. Then we sold them weapons. That's international trade. In May of 1975, the Shah came to Washington. He was still being a dick, but Nixon was out of office, uh, voluntarily. 
and Gerald Ford was in his place. Henry Kissinger was there because, for real, the guy was just fucking everywhere in those days. And so was National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft, whose declassified papers serve as the foundation for Andrew Scott Cooper's remarkably sober telling of this whole affair, Showdown at Doha, the secret oil deal that helped sink the Shah of Iran. They all had some pleasantries for a few days, a state dinner, nothing very productive in the grand scheme of things. Ford proved himself to be an ineffective statesman as he was virtually incapable of broaching the subject of oil prices, which was, and this is important, hurting both the U.S. and Iranian economies. One thing the Shah didn't anticipate when he raised prices? People buying less oil. So, he was at maximum production for top dollar, but he had a bunch of surplus because he couldn't offload it. In the end, None of these idiots comes out looking very skillful. I have mentioned that the global economy was kind of all over the fucking place because of Nixon's whole fuck you, the dollar isn't tied to gold initiative, right? If not, just imagine that in the middle of trying to do oil things, all the world leaders are calling each other like, what's the exchange rate of coconuts to Volkswagens? And you basically have the 1970s boiled down. Anyway, as the Shah is departing the US, he waves to the news cameras and says, I have decided that you can all go fuck yourselves, for I will be raising the price of oil yet again. And then he popped a balloon and disappeared. Now, because in 2021 the Shah is dead, and I think I can attribute any quote I want to him and it doesn't have to count as slander or libel, Kissinger, on the other hand, I'll have to hold my breath. So here's how I think this whole thing went down. The Shah pops his balloon, Ford spits out a mouthful of George Dickel, Kissinger wipes the dickel off his face, picks up the phone, and calls Bill Simon. Bill Simon puts on a bomber jacket and says, It's go time, motherfuckers. I think that's how it happened. The fragility of international trade is made more so by the perception of power on any nation's part. Even the clear position of dominance held by the dollar can't control how many dollars a barrel of oil costs. A warm relationship of arms deals, including F-16 fighter jets, which are technically considered weapons, and state dinners doesn't control the underlying chaos between and within nations. The U.S. was in a seriously poor position. Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, pointed out that another rise in oil prices would not only cause inflation and increased job losses in the U.S., but could bankrupt Britain, France, and Italy, trigger a banking crisis, and crush the emerging democracies of Spain and Portugal. The Shah's proposed price increase threatened to unleash the chaos that the U.S. had aimed to keep smothered in the post-World War II world. So, he threatened again a 20 to 25% increase in prices by 1977. Mind you, had the U.S. not essentially caused global inflation, this would all be much less of an issue. But we had to do war in Vietnam. Oh, that's right, by the way, Vietnam is going on. Anyway, Republicans blamed social programs, Democrats blamed Vietnam. In the spirit of should and should not, a nation should not lay blankets of napalm and Agent Orange on Vietnamese farmers, and one should try to eliminate poverty. So I'm going to give this one to the Democrats. Saudi Arabia was growing concerned with Iran's military buildup. New Arabian leadership was emerging that understood oil was leverage and that Saudi Arabia needed leverage against the Shah's rapid military growth. They were right to be concerned, as Kissinger and the Shah had hatched a plan for Iran to take control of Saudi Arabia's oil production in one of those wink-wink-in-case-something-bad-happens kind of schemes, and, as people do, there was gossip and confrontation, with Sheikh Yamani tearing the ambassador James Aikens a new asshole, accusing the U.S. of conspiring against the Saudis, to which Aikens replied, What the fuck, mate? Crisis averted. Kind of. President Ford and Sheikh Yamani met in July of 1976 and made a deal. The U.S. was thankful for Saudi Arabia's refusal to go along with another oil price increase and therefore offered, quote, support for multiple concerns, military aid and tacit approval of war things in Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Jordan, Somalia, and the Soviet Union. The relative value of oil to diplomatic and military support had been established, and the U.S. and Saudi Arabia became buddies. By December of 1976, Ford's White House had clashed with Congress over arms sales to Saudi Arabia, to the tune of some 650 air-to-ground Maverick missiles, and the Saudis were thankful. But the Shah was being an asshole again. Prices were going up, Mr. Ford, so fuck you and Kissinger and your little dog, Alan Greenspan. We're going to nosedive this whole goddamn world economy. And then I'm sure the Shah made a laugh like, Mwahaha, or something like that. But the Saudis, and this is important, they had a fuck ton more oil than Iran. Like 150 years worth of oil compared to Iran's, let's count them, 
15 years of oil production left. They were basically useless. So the Saudis come to the White House in December 1976, and they say, you know what? Fuck Iran and the rest of OPEC, except the United Arab Emirates. They're cool. We're going to crank up oil production to 11.6 million barrels of oil a day, up from 8.6 million, and undercut global oil prices because we have a fuck ton of oil and those missiles you gave us are awesome. They fly from the ground to the air really nice with big explosions and lots of death. Great missiles. What's funny here is to note that this whole time we've gone from Nixon to Ford to now Jimmy Carter, who won the 1976 election and would take office in 1977. Meanwhile, all the Middle East royal families had stayed the same and got to play one president against the next. Kind of like Kissinger, who often made promises to foreign leaders, assuring them once the new guy is in office, I'll tell him we have all this ironed out. Hey, remember how I said the Shah's intense lust for weapons drove his intense desire to raise oil prices and how that was, you know, making all the economies everywhere suffer, including his own? Well, that came to a head in 1976 when Iran's economy tanked. So much foreign money had come into Iran from oil sales that inflation had been rising steadily since the 1973 price increase. And by 1976, the construction boom of the early 70s had dried up, and those who had moved to the cities looking for work found none. And so, there was a lot of unemployment in Iran, as well as food shortages and an all-around glut of pissed-off Iranians. Like, lots of pissed off Iranians. Iran was hemorrhaging money and the Shah put all his eggs in the 1976 Doha OPEC summit basket. He needed them fucking bills to pay the fucking bills. Here is what inflation looks like in real time. One, rising prices. Two, shortages. That is, scarcity leads to higher demand and that demand leads to increased pricing. That was Iran in 1976, and that has been Iran since the Shah started his whole pricing war thing in 1973. That was accelerated by the Shah's unrestrained military spending and overall incompetence. Have I mentioned that Iranians were pissed? And the Americans were pissed, and no one liked the Shah. That's economics for you. So... The Shah looks forward to the OPEC meeting in Doha, Qatar, because he really needs the money from these oil price increases, and he's hoping everything works out at the Doha meeting, but the US and Saudi Arabia are like, nah, we're not doing Doha this go-around, good luck. And that's basically the death blow for the Shah and Iran. Oil production tanked, foreign news outlets were reporting in great detail about what the situation was like inside his own country, and the Shah's cabinet members responded as only they could, with ineptitude. Their spending cuts enraged the wealthy, caused a panic among the middle classes, and did nothing to cool inflation, reaching an estimated 30 to 40 percent by August 1977. In November of 77, the Shah came to a grand White House reception where he was greeted by thousands of protesters who broke through the barriers on the White House lawn. They got tear gassed, and because no one liked the Shah, one of the gas canisters bounced off a protester's head and pegged the Shah in the eyeball. Ha! Only Villains is another long chapter, so this is the end of part one. Part two will explain exactly why it's funny that the Shah got hit in the eyeball with a tear gas canister. We'll also explore this uh, need for the United States to have villains on the global economic stage. So part two is up next.